Christ will return as the righteous judge, the Bible tells us here. And Christ comes, he riding on a white horse, white horse in apocalyptic riding, the, apocalyptic, the style of riding of the Revelation, a symbol of victory. He is called faithful and true because he keeps his word and he will keep his covenants and he will not fail and he can be trusted. He is the righteous judge. And most of us, we're not opposed to God being judge. In fact, we like the idea when it's other people. I got a whole list of people I want God to judge, right? Isn't that how we approach it? They need some judging. They need some judging. That nation needs some judging. They need some judging. Oh, but when it comes close to home, when it comes, when it comes my way, I feel differently about it. And here's what the Bible says. We will all answer to Christ. In Romans 14, each of us will have to give a personal account to God. Each of us will stand personally before the judgment seat of God. The second coming of Christ says to us, don't kid yourself into thinking that you can go on sinning, go on thumbing your nose at God, and not be called to account before a righteous Christ. We will all answer. Jesus as judge really ought to be one of those things that awakens our surrender to Him, that, that focuses our, our, our attentions, that, that convicts us of our sinfulness, that we do not want to stand before Him as righteous judge in the uh, in a state of rebellion. Second thing, Christ will return as the holy God. He's not the God of convenience. He's not the magic genie in a bottle answering your request. He's not a God to be encompassed by our shallow, finite minds. I follow a series of Christian blogs, and a couple of those bloggers, they, they just think, you just have to have it all defined and all figured out. And you have to know everything there is to know about God. And you have to have every question answered. And everything about His character and His wonder is all encapsulated in teaching. That we, we have our, well, you know what? What I'd say to those guys is your God's too small. Because the God of the Bible is above you, beyond you. He is glorious and mighty. <laughs> He's shrouded in mystery. A name which no one knows except Himself, the Bible says, because... There's always the unknown. We will spend all of eternity exploring the glory of God and still never plumb its depths. He is separate from us, above us. He is holy, 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 holy Lord God Almighty. And as holy God, He just can't tolerate sin. He will not tolerate sin. And He won't tolerate the unholy and the impure. It says His eyes are a flame of fire. It means they penetrate. They penetrate beyond. We can put on a pretty good act for one another. Our, our public persona. The, the image we try to project on social media. But, but He knows what's really going on. He knows our motivations. He knows our attitudes. He sees the dark places that we can hide from even those closest to us. And we don't like to hear Jesus say, Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light. What you've whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. You think about this. One day you stand before this Jesus. Will you be able at any level to look into those penetrating eyes to stand before him when he comes again? Or will you be forced to look away in shame, to run in fear? And all you can say is, I failed to seek God's holiness and I fail to be holy as he is holy. And I desperately, I'm desperately broken. Third thing. Christ will return as God's final word. There's no mistaking the identity of the rider on the horse. The white horse. He is the word of God. When John wrote about Jesus in the gospel, he talked about him as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, He's the Word, and the Word became flesh, John says, and dwelt among us. The Word of God, whether it, is, whether it is spoken, which is powerful, whether it is in print in this Word of God, or whether it is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the purest, finest, fullest revelation of God, it is God's Word to us. Jesus is God's message, God's communication to us. You look at Jesus in the Gospels, in His first coming, Jesus shed His blood. He's the victim, paying the price for sin. Jesus in Revelation 19, He doesn't come as victim. His robe dipped in blood, but it's not His blood. 
It's the blood of his enemies because he doesn't come as a victim in Revelation 19. He comes as victor, victorious king of kings and lord of lords. And he executes his judgment and declares his glory. Jesus spoke. Jesus is the agent of the Father in creation, the Bible teaches us. He spoke and the world came into order. The world came into being. And it is by the spoken word that his enemies are destroyed. The picture here is not of Jesus who comes in love and grace. The Jesus Revelation 19. He comes in judgment on sin and sinners. The opportunity for uh, forgiveness and relationship and eternal life has passed at this point. Fate is sealed. Eternity is, is settled. The Bible talks about opportunity to receive Christ. But here... The window of opportunity has closed. There's no more second chances. Fate is sealed. Judgment is certain. Hell is real and reserved for those who have stubbornly resisted Christ. Who continue to say, I, got, I, ha- I think I have my own plan. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to define this relationship to God the way I want it to be defined. Instead of just saying yes to Jesus. Revelation 20 verse 15. It says, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life. He was thrown into the lake of fire. Do you know without a doubt your name is written in the book of life? Uh, most people, and I've, I've had, this con- had this conversation in Zambia. I had this conversation in Allen this week. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think so. Hope so. Uh, I think, I think I'm, I'm lean in that way in the scales of life. Oh, you don't want to face Jesus. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. You don't want to step into eternity. Just hoping it all works out. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. This is, this is not, a, not second chance time anymore when we get here. The, the lines are drawn and, and God's not playing games. We play so many games. God's not playing games. Then Christ will return as the triumphant king. When John writes, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, he's saying he has absolute authority. He has complete sovereignty. For the genuine believer, that title is already true. For for everyone else, they'll know it's true too. And they'll declare it too. But too late to change their eternal destiny and destination. I ran into someone this week uh, out making visits with some of our students and Someone who, they, uh, they didn't need it. I've had people in the last few months that I shared with, I don't need to do this. I don't believe. I don't want, I don't want your Jesus. I, don't, I believe in, in uh, I'm an atheist. I'm, I've had those conversations. But there's coming a day when they're all going to declare, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Here's how, John, here's how uh, Paul wrote about it in Philippians 2. Because of this, as Jesus comes in the second coming to execute his victory, because of this, God raised him up to the heights of heaven, talking about Jesus, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody's going to declare it. But for some, it'll be too late to change where they spend eternity. You know, when the wise men came from the east, they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? When Jesus was crucified, Pilate, Pilate posted a sign above his head at the cross, the king of the Jews. Whether he is born in a manger, crucified on a cross, or coming on the clouds of glory, you make no mistake about it, he is the king. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2 says, But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. Never before in the history of the world, I think, has our world deserved judgment more than it deserves it now. The, 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 The complete fierce judgment of God. In our own country, we like to think we're the good guys, but there's so much darkness and so much sin embraced here. And I think it is an accurate statement, uh, kind of a glorified imagination statement that 
uh, if God doesn't rain down his judgment on this nation, uh, just about have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We are deserving of the judgment of God and we have no place to turn except to the Savior. We've drifted so far from the mind of Christ. You know, don't kid yourself into believing that God, God takes willful disobedience lightly. Like it's just no, oh, well, you know, benevolent grandfather. Oh, you kids, I know how you're... God is so serious about these things. This is not a game to play, a religious game to play. Are you ready for the Christ of the second coming? And if not, how do you make yourself ready? You, you confess your sin to him. You, you ask for forgiveness and turn from sin. You put all your faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross and was raised from the dead. You, you surrender your life to him as, as Lord, Master, Leader, King of your life. And, and, and you live a long obedience in the same direction with Jesus. Jesus said to believers, blessed is the one who is found doing what the master asks. When Jesus comes again, he comes come today, he comes come soon. Maybe you just go to meet him. Will he find you doing what he asks you to do? Will he find you living the life he's called you to live? Are you going to be leaning into this? Or are you going to be just making stuff up about what it means to be a Christian? How you stand before the truth of his judgment, the fire of his eyes, the power of his word, the demands of his lordship. You know, time is short, and in the moment of his coming unknown, just after Jesus ascended back into heaven, angel said, Acts 1, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming again. You know, most Sundays we celebrate Jesus has come. We celebrate our Savior, what he did for us, the cross. God became one of us that we might know him, that we might understand his purpose for our lives. And his coming again, he's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. And will you be ready? Now, we started early in the hour with uh, Psalm 73, and I want to return to Psalm 73. Psalm 73 tells the story of our world. Asaph really captures this well. It's, it's a place all around. We have troubles and hurts and heartaches. And Asaph asks the questions we ask. Why do, why do bad people seem to do pretty well? Does it really pay off to be a Christian? It, how does this all work? And at the end of the chapter, he says, but for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord my refuge that I may tell of your works. In essence, he's saying, really, between here and the eternity that awaits me, wherever the road goes between here and the great hereafter, I will follow and I will follow faithfully and I'll not turn back and I'll not turn aside and I'll be found faithful to the end of my journey. There's some things I want you to remember in light of eternity. Living as a follower of Jesus Christ. Just four things. And, uh, experts, experts tell us that when it comes to real estate, there are three key things to consider in relationship to real estate. And those three things are? Yeah, location, location, location. So we're going to talk about location. Because we have this glorious eternity awaiting us. We have... King of kings, Lord of lords, coming for us. All that is out there. Meanwhile, not like Asaph, we're just living in this broken world and some broken lives. So what, what do we need to understand about here as we prepare for there? As we go on the journey toward there? And ever how far that there is for each one of us? Four things I want to share with you. The first thing about location and what matters about location. You live, <laughs> this is going to be a real revelation to you, you live in a dramatically fallen world. A dramatically fallen world. And you need to bring a biblical understanding to this place where you now live or you're going to go through life unprepared and disappointed every day. I've had that conversation in recent days where someone says, I just... I don't think God cares about me. I don't think God loves me. I, I pray, but nothing's working out the way I want it to. I didn't get this, and this didn't work out. And so, uh, well, 
just to clarify something about your location right now, and you, you really need to note this. Where we are right now in this world, is your pen ready? Because, boy, this is, a revel, this is another one of those big revelations. This is not heaven. Stop complaining to God like you expect this is the place of perfection. This is not heaven. Heaven's out there waiting for you. And it's glorious and perfect and beautiful. This is not heaven. So if you can just get it in, in your mind that everything's not going to be perfect here because this world is so broken by sin. And if it's in you or if it's around you, you're going to get impacted by it. So you're going to have a lot better life just now if you can just get to there. We live in a broken world. There's trouble on every side. Your body, your mind are affected by the brokenness of the world. The sin that inhabits this world and inhabits us. Your faith, your family, your friendship. Uh, not going to work the way that they're designed. The government does not function the way it should function. Do you have any questions about that? Uh, for Christians, Christians in America, how many of you believe that our greatest hope is what's happening in Washington, D.C. or Austin, Texas this week? Man, you're barking up the wrong tree, friends. There are a bunch of knuckleheads there, and they're broken, and their systems are broken, and we've got to quit putting all our hopes for changing the spiritual life of America in government's hands. We've got to go tell people about Jesus. That's what changes lives. So let's get up and get going with what God told us to do and quit substituting other things to fix our world. I'm out of breath now. Paul even says that the physical environment is affected by sin. This, the, the very creation itself, here's how it reads. The whole world groans waiting for redemption. The creation itself is going, how long until this is made right? Here's, here's what you can know. There's no escaping it. You're located in a place where trouble of some kind is going to greet you every morning. Tomorrow morning, Monday morning, good morning. And here's a whole new set of troubles. Here's some, here's some new difficulties you're going to face. You live in a place where somewhere, somehow, every morning you're going to wake up throughout the day and temptation is going to say, I'm so glad you're here. Have I got a deal for you? And you're going to meet with temptation every day. The more you face the harsh reality of how broken the world is, the better prepared you're going to be for the troubles that come your way as you follow Jesus from where you are in this broken world to there. Second thing about location, the big battle. This big battle in this broken world is fought in Washington uh, with your wife or your husband or your boss. No, it's fought right here in your little old heart. That's where the big battle's fought, in your heart. In acknowledging the brokenness of the world where you live, you don't want to give way. This is my new, one of my new favorite phrases because so many people embrace it. Spiritual environmentalism. I came across that in some study the other day, spiritual environmentalism. And it's the idea that all my problems are my environment's fault. It's, it's because of my, my crazy family. It's because of, my mother bottle fed me till I was three. It's because, uh, because of my boss, because of my neighbors, because of uh, what they're doing in Washington or Austin. Or what, we, we get, it, it's all about my environment. You know, there were, some, uh, there were some guys who really wanted to be spiritual in the Middle Ages, and they decided, what we need to do is we need to get out of this environment with all these crazy people. We really love God, so we're just going to pull back into some monasteries, and we're going to be really, really spiritual because we're going to break away from the environment. But you know what happened? They took their hearts with them, and they fought with one another, and they didn't get along, and all that stuff, it came with them because the big battle is not the environment. It's in the heart. That's where sin always begins. It begins in the heart. The biggest danger to every human being is located inside of us, not outside of us. And there's just something deep, dark, and deceitful that lurks in the heart of every one of us. And, and even as believers in Christ, we're not, not yet fully glorified, fully set free from that power of sin, and we're living in this sinful world. And it's ever the sin inside of me that draws and hooks me into the sin outside of me. The big battle for righteousness, right relationship to God, right relationship to others, is always fought inside of you, not outside of you. Every day there's a war for control of your heart. Every day. 
And, and your Savior, Jesus Christ, will not share your heart. He will not rest until your heart is ruled by Him and Him alone. Third thing. When, when life is hard and when things are difficult, you will run somewhere for refuge. You're always going to run somewhere for refuge. Every one of us has a go-to. Often it's, uh, it's your default setting. You're going to go somewhere in the middle of trouble, when you're in the heat of the battle, you will run somewhere for refuge. You'll run somewhere for rest, comfort, peace, encouragement, wisdom, healing, strength. And Asaph gets it right at the end of this psalm of trouble and hope. And he talks a lot about trouble, and he lands it with hope that there's only one place to run where true protection, rest, and strength can be found. You just have to learn to make the Lord your refuge. That He's your first place, your only place you go to find that safe place, to find that refuge, to find that hope. It's in Him. There are so many false refuges we run to. When we're sharing our three circles, uh, many of you know that we talk about you're trapped. You're trapped and broke. You're in, in a broken world and you're trapped in brokenness. And you hate it, so you try to get out. And we'll draw some squiggly lines. Some people say money. I'll make a lot of money and I'll get out of my brokenness. I'll, some, I'm going to... Chase relationships. I, I'm going to, education is going to break me out of my brokenness. Some people will say, you know, sex or drugs or any number of things. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break out. And all those things we found just wrap you deeper in the brokenness. Here, some people run to entertainment to try to numb their troubles away. Some people run to a substance to turn off the pain. Maybe you run to food, sex, fighting pain with pleasure. But none of those things can provide the refuge that we seek. And putting your hope there just adds to the disappointment and the trouble that you're already experiencing. And you're trapped deeper in the brokenness. God is your only refuge and strength. And only He has the power to rescue and deliver you. And only He has the grace you need to face whatever you're facing. Run to Him. And often, in our hardest times, people run away from God. Run to Him. He's waiting for you. Fourth thing about location. Where you are heading, trouble will be no more. This isn't heaven, but heaven's out there for followers of Jesus Christ. The biblical story is about three locations. In the garden, in Genesis, it was a location of perfection and beauty, and it became a location of sin and trouble. The hill of Calvary, the hill of the cross, was a place of horrible suffering, became a place of transforming grace. And the new Jerusalem, that heaven that's waiting for us, that place of peace and refuge lit by the brightness, the glory of the Son of God will be our final refuge forever. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, your story and some of you, story is pretty rough right now. Your story will not end in tragedy and trouble and temporary refuge. And your location is going to be unlike anything you have ever experienced on your very best and brightest day. And you are headed for the new Jerusalem where the final tear will be dried, where the trouble will be no more. Today, you will face trouble of some kind. Today, you are all going to run for refuge somewhere. And today, there is hope and help to be found. And I'm just encouraging you. Let God be your refuge. Turn to Him with all your heart. Remember, He has promised there is coming a day. Coming a day when troubles will be no more. No more. I've talked to so many people who, when I, when I ask them the reason for the hope that is within them, of forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternal life, they, they point to religious activities that they have done. Well, I was baptized, I was confirmed. They'll point to a list of good deeds. Here's my, here's my resume of being a nice guy. Uh, I'll have people who will say, I've always been a Christian. Well, you know, no one's always been a Christian. That's not a Christian testimony. There's a point in time where, we'll do it this way. There was a time in my life, any of you know how that story goes? There was a time in my life, a simple testimony, there was a time in my life when I realized I was lost, separated from God, and if I died, I was going to hell. And it gave me such a sense of fear and, and burden. And then I came to know Christ, 
and I, and I confess my sin to him and I ask him to forgive me and I put all my faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, surrendered my life to him. And now I have a hope and a peace that has carried me through a hundred different crises and difficulties over the course of my life. And I know that one of these days I'm going to heaven. Do you have a story like that? Do you have a story like that? You need a story like that. A time when you began a relationship to Christ. A time when there was a time I was lost and there was a time I was found. And this is my story. It's 1139. So, I told you about a young man. I'm trapped in brokenness. Uh, and he, he went through that whole thing. He said, I want, can you share this with my five friends? I had two, two church members from the church I was with, with me. And we started down a dusty road. And we walked a mile and a half in one direction. We got to the house. He went in. And not one of the five was home. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. Can, can you come back at 2 o'clock? So we walked a little over two miles back to where we were having lunch. Where uh, we were having our caterpillars. And I stoked up on caterpillars. And then we walked a little over two miles. All the way back to his house at 2 o'clock. And he wasn't even there. We had his phone number at that point. We called him. And he was down at the market. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Well, great. We just burned a big chunk of this day chasing your imaginary friends. And I thought, oh, man. Now what are we going to do? It was, and, and it was cool in the mornings to the tune of low 50s. Cho choose your mission trips carefully. Uh, in July. Uh, but it's hot in the afternoon. It's tropical sun. And I thought, okay, so now here we are. We're way down here on the far end of everything. Now what are we going to do? And I hear this. And I said, what in the world was that? That's the copper mine. It was an enormous copper mine. This is the, our region we were in was called the Copper Belt. A series of copper mines. It was an enormous copper mine. Several thousand employees and that sound was shift change. This is what happens. Well, there are multiple gates because it's a huge facility. And the elder of the church in his 70s, he's with me. He's made all these, walk, all these steps with me. He's a trooper. He said, well, maybe somebody will be coming out from work. They've just finished some of them 12 hours, some of them 16 hour shifts. Maybe there's somebody here we could share with. We were 200 yards from the entrance and exit of the plant. So we went walking down there and he sees a couple of guys and he says, uh, and he's, he's speaking the local language. Most of the, most of the time we're sharing in English. Uh, we're speaking the local language, Bimba. And he says, blah, blah, blah. And I heard, I heard Mazungu in the conversation. Which, uh, I know, okay, well, that was on me. Because what he's basically saying is, hey, this is a special opportunity because I got the Mazungu with, with us. Which means, this is a white guy. So, Mazungu is the white guy. So, I got the white guy with us. Would you like to hear the good news of Jesus? And so, these two guys, they've been on this long shift. And they go, man, Sure. Which I'm thinking, I don't know if I would have. I'm glad that they're willing to stop. And so I started a little introduction of who I was and what we were doing there and thanking them for taking time after a long shift to visit with us. And, and then all of a sudden there are 20 guys standing there. Somewhere between the ages of about 25 and 35. And they all, they all stood around. And I was using Evangel Cube this time because there's a lot of people and I'm showing pictures and talking through the story of the gospel. So we went through and, and, and I shared with great passion. And because uh, I share with passion lots of times, but Jungle Chad is a lot different than Alan Chad. So we kind of let, let fly when I'm Jungle Chad. And um, so... I'm sharing the gospel with my Vanja Cube and I share with them and then we get down to the end and I say to them, would you like, and I gave my testimony, there was a time in my life when I knew it was lost, separated from God. 
I committed my life to Jesus, surrendered my life to Him, put all my faith in Jesus, who died on the cross for me, was raised from the dead. And now I have a hope and I have a peace that's carried me through loss, through physical difficulty, that still my, my thorn in the flesh continues with me to this day. I've asked God to relieve me of it like Paul. And now I've added one in the last year that I can, my, my vision after seven eye surgeries in the last year and a half, still pretty rough in my right eye. And I said, uh, but I have a peace and I have a hope because of Jesus. Do you have a story like that? And would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ? And don't do it because the Mazungu ask you. Don't do it because I'm here. Do this because you know it's what God wants you to do. Because you see that you're separated from God and broken and lost. And, and that you want to know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. And I want to give you the opportunity somebody gave me to say yes to Jesus. But I'm, and I know you guys, you've all worked a long shift and you're tired. But if you would like to give your life to Jesus right now, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. But, but it has to, it's not just because I asked, not because your friends are doing it. It has to be because it's you, your heart to God's heart. But you just got to, please give your life to Jesus. But I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I told them, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and just say, I want to do this because I know I'm separated from God by my sin and I know Jesus paid for my sin. So I'm going to ask you just to, just to raise your hand to let me know. And if, if none of you do, I love you and I'll continue to pray for you. And I'm thankful that you gave me this time. But would... would would anybody want to do that? And you know, it's a peer pressure thing, a bunch of young adult guys, and they all look at each other and shift and shift. And then one guy in the back of the pack, he just, he just raised his hand up. And I said, thank you. You and I are going to share in a prayer. And then every hand shot up. These 20 guys. The reason the... And by the way, the young guy who wanted me to introduce, introduce us to his friends, we found him the next day. Uh, and it was awesome. These 20 guys, and I told them, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. I want to lead you in the same kind of commitment prayer I prayed when I gave my life to Jesus. And we all held our hands up, and I led them in a commitment prayer. And I want to give you the opportunity to do the same thing right now, to pray a prayer to the Lord and say, today's my day. And you can lift your hand if you want to. You can fall on your knees if you want to. You can visit with me after the service. But I'm going to lead in this prayer out loud. And if you'd like to pray it with me just now, we're going to, we're going to bow our heads. And as I pray out loud, you can pray silently. You can pray out loud, whatever you want to do. But we're going to give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ just now. So let's bow in prayer. And maybe you would pray. Dear God in heaven, Thank you that you love me, a sinner. I admit that I have sinned, and I ask for your forgiveness. I want to turn away from sin. Today, I turn my life to Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was raised from the dead. I believe He is God the Son. Come into my life, Jesus. Take away my sins. I want to follow You with all my heart. For the rest of my life, You are my King. You are my Lord. Father God, Erase my name from the book of death. Today, because of Jesus in my heart, I ask God, write my name in your book of life in heaven. I will serve you, follow you, obey you, and one day, thank you for the promise. I'll be with you forever in heaven. In the name of Jesus, my Savior, Jesus, my Lord, amen.